Hi everyone. This week marks the 10 year anniversary of the day that Lee Alexander McQueen took his own life in his London apartment. McQueen was one of the greatest fashion designers of all time, certainly one of the most influential fashion designers of all time. And I wanted to do something a little bit different this week. Instead of uh, doing a runway show analysis of some kind to remember the incredible life of someone who means a lot to us, I wanted to read some tributes to McQueen's work and his life from people that are on my Patreon Discord. Just having some time for us to reflect and remember some of the things that made his work so impactful and meaningful to us. So we'll, um, we have about 10 here and we'll just start from the top and read through for all of them. Spring, summer, 2001, Boss. Look 76, the final look worn by Erin O'Connor. The bottom of this red and black dress is made out of ostrich feathers with the top that's made out of glass microscope slides painted red. McQueen described the glass painted slides as a representation of humans, stating, there's blood beneath every layer of skin. This look is seductive and exposed. The feathers are exciting and evoke intrigue, but the true importance of this look emerges from the juxtaposition of the feathers with the glass. The microscope slides suggest a form of examination onto the subject, projecting a pure sense of vulnerability. The feeling is further emphasized by the completely exposed right side of the dress. The color of the dress itself clearly represents blood, a grim reminder of the truth of our biological vulnerability. The wide window of exposed skin can also be seen in this same regard because of the weakness of our soft flesh. The exposed skin also calls to sexual vulnerability and opening yourself up to someone else, letting them see your skin and judge your beauty. To me, this dress represents the strength of vulnerability, a calling to be my true self, to be vulnerable and open myself up to others. The reality that this dress exposes is the fact that you can never hide behind your skin. Skin and blood is what you are. There is no other defense to hide behind. The glass itself has an ominous connotation as the clinking when the wearer moves is a constant reminder that the glass, even if slightly shattered, will pierce into us. You cannot hide when wearing this dress. When the model, Erin O'Connor, walks off the stage, she stretches her arms out wide as if proclaiming, this is real, this is me. I strive to own this attitude. Do not hide your flaws, your insanities, or your fears. Be you. Own your skin. Fall, winter 2009, Horn of Plenty, look 10. McQueen creates a garish caricature of consumption through the clothing creating exaggerated silhouettes of characters of legacy houses. Look 10 in particular takes aim at John Galliano's Dior Haute Couture, which was extremely opulent and impossible to wear. McQueen co-ops the iconic Dior bar jacket and pencil skirt, turning it into something almost gruesome in its over-exaggeration, which is amplified by the large, striking houndstooth print that many of the looks feature and play with. The headpiece exemplifies the connection to Galliano's Dior because he would feature these ridiculous, unwearable headpieces, and McQueen pokes fun at this with this almost elephant-like headpiece that takes on an origami-like form, which is not surprising as McQueen often uses the East as a muse. The styling also supports this theme of making a mockery of rich people at the top of society, featuring overdrawn lips and pale makeup that creates a clown-like effect. As if to say, look at these people. They think their blood runs blue, but they are just clowns in couture. This look for me, and to a greater extent the whole collection, is emblematic of McQueen's incredible ability to create clothes that pulled and took from diverse references. He had something to say with layers of meaning and a postmodern self-awareness of both himself and the fashion industry, and he still managed to create beautiful work. Legendary designers can at most excel in two of these areas, but to be able to do all four at once, this is what puts McQueen in his own league. He's one of my favorite designers of all time. Fall Winter 1998, Joan of Arc, and Dante, Fall Winter 1996. The Dante show is almost like McQueen's coming out party. Before this, all his prior shows had almost had a tacky, gimmicky edge to them for shock value. Here, he really shows his amazing talents. If it wasn't for McQueen, I wouldn't be pursuing fashion at all. In high school, 
I love fashion so much and just wanted to learn. I literally just Googled fashion designers and this name I had never heard of popped up, Alexander McQueen. I became obsessed and learned everything I could about him. Before McQueen, I thought that all designers just came from money and that I could never become a designer because I don't have a wealthy background. When I learned about his life and that he came from a dirt poor family in a household of seven siblings, I said, well, shit, if he can do this, I can too. Spring, summer 2001, Voss, razor clam dress. This is one of the rare pieces that set off a eureka moment for me. Fashion, and especially high fashion, are typically considered to be trifling subjects, not worthy of serious consideration. McQueen shows generally, and the razor clam dress in particular, are powerful antidotes to this misconception. The dress and its materials are such a stark departure from any normal conception of what clothing can constitute. It kind of forces you to reckon with the conceptual forces behind it and to respect the artistry required to sculpt it, never mind the logistics required to source the material. It's a perfect confluence of technique and art. Few living designers can stake a claim to inspiring this kind of reckoning. Lee Alexander McQueen was one of a gifted few that possessed the talents to create objects of such profound beauty that while they can stand on their own as aesthetic paragons in a context-free vacuum, they also use the lens of clothing to effortlessly beckon us to consider a vastly more complex vision of how we relate to each other and how we relate to the wider world around us. Autumn, winter, 1995, Highland Rape. The Highland Rape Collection is often remembered as a scandalous performance that placed McQueen firmly into the public stage for being the bad boy of British fashion. But this show is not just any stepping stone for his career. While it's not the full-fledged, wide-screen cinematic drama that his later shows will be known for, painted with luxurious fabrics, this show offers a deeply truthful and grounded experience. It is rough and direct, and while at the same time displaying a captivating, shimmering dreaminess on its surface and offering an acceptable and comprehensible story. This truthfulness being in touch with the pains of existence that can be felt as well now as in the 18th century and having the means and courage to speak that strongly and clearly about it makes this show special. To me, the green and copper dress is the most magical piece in that collection. The thin cloth is ripped up and hanging in tethers from being brutalized. It does not provide any shelter, neither to force or even to the eye since a hole exposes the crotch. It only serves as a document of applied forces and struggle. On the other hand, its colors and textures reflects that of a rock, ages old, covered in moss and algae. The contained ores from rusty spots where they were exposed to the wind and rain over years. The rock sees the eroding forces come and go. It is marked by them, but it endures, and it will keep enduring, whatever catastrophes may happen around it. Combining these polarities in such simplicity makes this dress a powerful statement of strength. Powerful forces have shred all protection and shelter away, but instead of being broken and desperate, the timeless strength of the weathered stone is revealed, proudly displaying its precious metals. However weak and shredded this body of cloth may be, proclaims the stone. The spirit of the land and the people will remain untouched. Very few artists are able to build such an expansive universe as McQueen, and even less have the rigor and discipline to stay creative under the immense pressure he was working under, creating such a huge legacy in only a few years. Some artists seem to have the fate of being the creative channel of so much art that it ultimately consumes them. And while he did not have much space in his life to enjoy himself, the amount of beauty that Lee manifested was that of several lifetimes. Fall Winter 2006, Menswear. This collection was intriguing to me as it played with the themes of health and sickness, two polar opposites which come together to create an eerie and slick show embodying horror and fantasy. This look caught my eye when I first saw it. It displays a pale-faced model with sunken eyes and high-waisted billowing trousers and a beautifully embroidered black jacket which is very reminiscent of a military band. The military imagery gives the look an aggressive and intimidating feel, as well as a gothic edge with the pattern and button system on the chest being similar to the chains and bondage imagery, which is prominent within the gothic aesthetic. The triangular shape to the torso adds to the aggressive feel and leads the eyes down to the high-waisted trousers, which 
gives a feminine aspect to the look and even a sex appeal which concurs with the theme of the vampiric imagery as Dracula was notoriously a womanizer. The way the trousers flood the shoes illustrates the idea of a cape dragging on the floor and even the engulfing darkness associated with vampires. The billowing and rolling blackness is an entrancing look and enthralls the viewer, entrapping them in the awe of the look. Use of black for the entire look is done to an excellent degree and emphasizes the pale skin of the hands and the face of the model even more, displaying him as a frightening fictional creature or sickly patient. It looks as if he may have been drained of his blood by a vampire prior to this look and is waiting for the poison to set in so he can transform. Overall, this is a disturbing look into McQueen's psyche and the horrors that come with sickness and with health. Autumn Winter 1997. This suit jacket, to me, reads as the thesis statement for this entire show. The most fully animalistic, bestial piece McQueen ever sent down a runway. On first glance, it appears to be made of an entire sort of antelope with the horns and the hair on the leather. The way the shoulders sit turn the arms into the hind legs of some sort of creature. It looks painful and distorted while still being regal. As expected from McQueen, the tailoring is flawless. It fits just like a skin, just adding to the effect. This show saw models with matted, ratty hair and animal makeup transformed into creatures akin to a wildlife safari. Even with an accidental, unplanned fire that occurred during the runway show, the centerpiece of the whole performance was, by far, this absolutely wild piece. Autumn Winter 2009, Horn of Plenty, Look 42. This look came thrashing down the runway with a wind-knocking power, as if she were what had broken the mirrored panels that covered the floor of McQueen's second-to-last show. But you couldn't even see her feet that were moving with such power. She was floating in an ethereal fishtail dress emblazoned with an ensnaring pattern of the Scarlet King Snake. And out of the effortless cutting, the model was covered with an intricate array of silver plates splattered with red Swarovski cabochons that glimmered like blood. The armor-like cladding was actually reused from spring-summer 2000's Eye Collection and was a play on the Muslim garment of a yashmak. There it was paired only with a skimpy bikini bottom to juxtapose the concept of modesty the yashmaks symbolize, building on the West-Middle East interplay of the season. In Horn of Plenty, however, the reuse of the yashmak instead developed the show's themes of recursion in fashion. But in the context of McQueen at large, this look takes on a greater meaning for me. It is everything that I see when I think of Lee. To me, it represents the clash of vulnerability and power that ran through the veins of Lee's creative output. Because when I see a McQueen piece, I feel strong, but not through a dominance over someone else, but a dominance over my flaws, or rather an acceptance and weaponization of those flaws. Because even though the yashmak that covers the model is more skin than metal, it maintains an energy of the strongest armor. It is a power extracted from the flesh. The clothes are the conduit to discover the true self that can be so hard to find. The fabric that Lee cut did not just lay on the skin, it permeated into the flesh and into the soul, the clothes and the wearer forming a symbiosis that was always meant to be. But the hands that formed the clothes and formed a part of myself are now limp and have been limp for 10 years. Even so, I can still feel the fingers pressing down on me, on my shoulders, on my skin. To quote Sean Lien, the jeweler who made the yashmak with McQueen, I was devastated, but the energy that we embraced together when we worked, that never left me. And it has not left me either. Even though his hands have been long cold, I still feel warmth radiating from my core. Yes, it still brings me an absolute sadness to have him gone and gone in such a way, but it still brings a joy that he was able to provide such an energy while he was still with us. And so, dear Lee Alexander McQueen, thank you. You are my stethoscope of cloth. With you, I can hear my own heartbeat. Before we wrap up, if you're struggling with thoughts of self-harm or of suicide, there are people who really do want to help you. And it's okay if you feel like there isn't anyone in your life that you feel comfortable talking to about these thoughts. The suicide prevention hotline is, it's not just for people who are standing on a bridge and they're about to jump off. 
This is for people who might be in that very situation all the way down to just people who don't seem to be enjoying any of the things that they used to enjoy and everything around them feels very muted and the thought just kind of keeps popping back up just thinking, what if I did do that? They're truly lovely people. No one is gonna break your door down and force you to do anything. It's really just people who are there to talk if you are feeling despondent and scared. You are good. You are enough. You are worthy of love exactly the way that you are. Thank you for joining me.